CIO club members. Uh, it's a long weekend. Many of us are traveling. People are on holidays. But I'm, uh, the topic is so important that we couldn't wait. And that's the reason uh, we had to do it on the Sunday as the bill became the act in a span of five days. So we as IT leaders, we were trying to grasp whatever information we got and interpret it in the best possible way in the last one week. That's when we at the Mumbai chapter quickly thought about getting an expert to demystify the act by arranging this session for you all. So let me quickly introduce you to a person who has made her name in the intricate realm of cyber laws and data protection in India. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Advocate Puneet Bashin, a legal luminaire whose remarkable journey has left an indelible mark on the landscape of cyber legalities. Her role as an advisor to the esteemed Rajya Sabha Committee on Internet Laws underscores her commitment to shaping policies that govern the digital econo economy. Her accolades are a testament to her exceptional contributions, having been bestowed with five prestigious national awards included the most coveted title of best cyber lawyer in India. Today, we have the privilege of delving into the nuances of recently passed act and its associated cyber laws under Advocate Bashin's insightful guidance. So without further ado, let us warmly welcome Advocate Puneet Bashin to share her expertise, experiences and perspectives with us. Over to you, Advocate. Good evening. I hope I'm clearly audible and uh, really glad for all of you to join uh, the session on a Sunday. Uh, this subject is of great importance. One of the reasons being uh, data is something which is being used and misused in today's time to a great extent. So to some extent, I would say this is of extreme importance, not just as an organization, but also as individuals today to understand what's going to happen to your data thereafter once the act uh, has come into force, which it already has. Exactly. How are you going to deal with other organizations handling your data? How will your organization deal with handling other people's data? And uh, the entire, you could say, penal landscape, landscape that comes in with this. So that's one of the reasons why this gains a lot of prominence today. India is among a few nations which have actually enacted this uh, law. The reason being, if you see the nations like uh, uh, China, they have a very, very stringent uh, legal regime where a lot of data sharing is not allowed. There are very stringent laws with respect to data protection. Uh, you see the Western uh, countries, many of them do not have very stringent laws uh, regulating data. And uh, India somewhere is in the middle, which is a very balanced approach which the legislation has taken. Now, before I delve into the various aspects of the act, uh, there are a lot of naysayers that say that, oh, this act may not survive further. Again, there is going to be a lot of judicial challenge to the act. There will be people who will challenge this uh, sections of this act, say that this is unconstitutional, as happens with every single legislation. But you need to understand that if this act was not enacted right now, India would have been in, a, a, you could say, a serious trouble with respect to its data being misused, not just by Indian organizations for marketing purposes, but also by international bodies, other countries, so many kind of risks of cyber warfare that arise out of access to Indian data. So to a great extent, uh, the enactment is the need of the hour from a national security perspective also. And uh, the second thing which is very important about the enactment is it's been five to six years that, you know, there has been a lot of deliberation about the law. There were multiple bills which were there in 2018, 2021. And now again, just deliberating over a legislation and not having anything in place, I guess is a very bad option. Instead, having a legislation with basic parameters that are matching the current uh, industry landscape and post that amending it. You can have amendments uh, uh, every uh, year based, especially in technology laws. It's at, uh, absolutely important to keep amending the law because it's completely going to get. Uh, Puneet, your mic got uh, muted. Uh... Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are now. Uh, I hope I'm audible to the uh, audience. Yes, yes, you are. You are. You don't oh, want... was I audible? 
also uh, last 10 seconds we missed you okay okay so uh, the part where i had left off was then i guess the last 10 seconds was where i was talking about the fact that it's ad absolutely important to have a legislation in place so which meets some level of industry standards and post that yes annually amendments can happen so you understand one thing technology law is not something like a uh, uh, indian contract act it is not something like uh, the transfer of property act where the definition of property is going to remain the same where the concept of contract is going to remain the same instead it is something which is dynamically changing so a simple example being today you buy any technology buy a particular laptop buy a particular cell phone within two months it is absolutely redundant and you are looking at a new version of everything now the same thing is with respect to data threats cyber threats today a cyber threat which is existing undergoes a complete number of changes so you may end up thinking oh i have combated a cyber threat today that really doesn't mean that you are successful because tomorrow there is going to be a brand new threat which is going to again challenge your capabilities so you believe you have let's say scored a 10 and had the full capability to deal with a threat x tomorrow there is going to be a threat y and your 10 on 10 capability is also going to be lesser for that and you will suddenly need a 11th capability so the data protection law also you need to understand will continue evolving so the act itself enunciates that there are going to be multiple rules which are going to be passed in segments slowly and this itself shows the legislative intent that it is going to remain in time with the laws it's going to remain in time with the way society is changing technological landscape is changing uh, with this i guess giving a brief background uh, i would uh, request the next slide to uh, start the main uh, subject Now, what is the concept of data, data fiduciaries, data principles? Who are all these people? So when we are talking about data, uh, it's a very simple word. But uh, there's one thing that you need to understand. The implication that it carries is tremendous. Uh, one of the key reasons being that a four-letter word can actually make your organization go up and down completely. A breach of this four-letter word in your organization can cost you 250 crores in penalty. It can ensure that, you know, your entire organization probably is not able to function for maybe a day or two till you really get things back on track. So the kind of losses that can happen merely because of this four-letter word. So the legislature refers to this four-letter word, personal data. So data in general means any data that is available about you on the Internet. And when we're talking about personal data, it is primarily data that can identify you as you. Now, one of the reasons over here in the slide, I haven't put in too much of, uh, you could say, images and content. And again, a lot of bullet points under each thing uh, is because of my simple philosophy where I believe that, you know, uh, all senses don't work at the same time. So if you're going to continue reading, you are not going to hear. So I would suggest, uh, you know, even the video would be available later that uh, you all can hear the explanation of it well. And obviously, even the bare act is available for you to read the content of that in any which case. So coming back to the definition of data, what we are talking about over here is personal data. So it, let's give an example of personal data being data that can identify you as you. It can identify you as you directly. It can identify you as you indirectly. Now, over here, the concept of you doesn't only mean you as an individual. It means you as an HUF, it can be you as a firm, it can be you as a Section 8 company, it can be you as a corporate, it can be you as any incorporated entity or association, including CIO Club, which is an association. So you can include a lot of things. You means the data subject, it means the data principle. So when I say data being directly and indirectly referring to you or leading back to you, uh, the direct means, obviously, is where it is your name, where it is uh, data about, let's say, your uh, profiles online, about uh, something that is directly linking to you. Indirectly linking to you is going to mean your email ID. It could mean your contact number. So things whereby directly a person may not know who you are. But yes, this data clue is more than enough to understand that we are referring to you itself as a person. So... That is something which is uh, important to understand about the concept of data. Now, let's come to the concept of a data fiduciary. Now, a data fiduciary in simple terms is the person or an organization who determines when your data will be collected, how will it be collected, how will it be stored, how will it be processed. 
So this is the entity or individual who is the mastermind of your data collection, data usage and data processing. The data fiduciary is also going to determine who is the individual or organization who's going to process your data and how. Now, next we need to come on to the concept of a data processor. So who is a data processor? A data processor is basically going to basically going to be an organi organization or an individual who is designated the jobs so or contractually a data fiduciary has to contractually enter into a relation with a data processor for processing your personal data whatever the contract has to entail the terms have to be obviously in consonance with the data protection law of india it has to cover all these aspects I would request uh, to move to the second slide, please. So that exactly we saw the concept of a data processor. Uh, I can see a lot of people having comments as to, you know, the multiple slides. As I told you, uh, this is an extempore speech. Uh, please focus on the talk, the lecture and the slides will not have too many bullet points. The same thing can be read by you, the points also in a bare act, and I'm sure there's a lot of data available everywhere. So what I am primarily focusing on is uh, the explanation and the understanding and meaning of these terminologies and their application. So we were talking about a data processor. So the data processor primarily, as I said, contractually, the contract has to be very strong. It has to be good whereby there is an obligation that is there on him to process data in a particular way for a particular cause and a particular security as prescribed by law, as prescribed contractually has to be maintained by him. So that comes to the point of grounds of processing data. They have to be legitimate. So the act actually completely describes and mandates that if any organization is processing data, now this applies to data processors, this also applies to the data fiduciaries, the people who are collecting your data, that they can only process it for a legitimate cause. The term legitimate cause, what would that really mean? So let's say today you are opening a bank account. So the data you have provided is to open the bank account. So that's a legitimate cause. Now let's say the bank shares your data with the allied insurance companies it is working with or with, let's say, any other share brokering investment firms, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's not a legitimate data processing. So if you have given your data for banking, then opening up the bank account, offering you banking services, that is only the legitimate ambit of your data usage. So the law mandates that in the case you are uh, taking anybody's data, personal data of a data subject, then in that situation, it has to be only for the purpose that it was taken. It has to be a legitimate processing of data. Now, obviously, if it is not legitimate, what happens? We will come towards that to the end where there are penalties imposed for you not processing the data or collecting data in an illegitimate format or illegitimate way usage of data upon a complaint being made by a data principal can attract a high level of penalties. Uh, the next slide, please. So when does data usage become legitimate? Consent. So where we saw previously that somebody has taken your data, let's say again a bank as an example, they are going to go about taking your data for opening a bank account. Now when they're opening that bank account and you're providing your personal data, there has to be an explicit consent and a notice of consent that has to be provided by them to you. That is non-negotiable under the act. And that forms the basis of legitimate processing. So tomorrow, let's say in any litigation or case that comes up of a breach against you, and the question comes of consent, the most important thing over here is being able to prove that you had the consent of the data principle. So the consent notice and the consent is what forms the absolute basis of you legitimately processing data. You cannot say it was implied. Oh, the person came to my bank to open a bank account. So it's implied that he has to provide me his Aadhaar card. It's implied that he has to give me his name. That is, there is no implied concept over here existing. Everything is informed consent. 
So basically what this would end up meaning is whenever you are collecting any data, you will have to give an informed consent. Now, let's see the concept of a notice of consent and consent. Now, prior to you accepting the data, now let's say the point where there is a, a data which is there uh, for, again, let's take the bank example where you are a bank and uh, I am approaching you to open my bank account. Now, before you take that Aadhaar card from me, before you even ask me to fill up my name in your form, first thing is the notice of consent that you need to provide me. What does this notice have to have? The first point that the notice has to have is, first of all, why are you collecting the data? What's the objective? What service are you going to provide me for which this data is needed? Secondly, who are the data processors? How are they going to process my data? Where is my data going to be stored? What kind of security you have deployed for the protection of my data? The next important thing that you will have to mention there is going to be what are my rights? So the act actually uh, uh, draws up a list of rights which a data principal has. So what are the rights that I have? That has to be listed out. We are going to see those rights also further in the next slides. But the list of rights has to be there. After that, it is mandated that the details of the data protection officer in case of a significant data fiduciary or in the event you are not a significant data fiduciary, then the contact details for the data protection board have to be provided. Now, why are you providing this? You are providing this so that if the data principal feels you have misused their data or there is a data breach, then in that situation, they can actually file a complaint against you. So in simple words, it has to be a written consent, notice which is there, the notice has to encapsulate, again, I'm going to uh, in brief mention it to you again, why the data is being collected, how the data is being collected, by whom it is being processed, for what it is being processed, how is it going to be stored, all the rights that a data subject has that he can exercise with respect to the data he is providing to you, and the details of a data protection officer in the event of it being a significant data fiduciary, and in the case of it being a regular data fiduciary, um, the DPO details may not be needed. However, in case of both significant and regular data fiduciaries, the contact details and the links for the data protection board have to be provided wherein a data principal is made aware that he can complain against you. So in a way, you are actually empowering the data principal. You are educating him that if I go wrong somewhere, please sue me. That's literally the way it is. That even if he doesn't have the knowledge that he can sue you, you have to educate him enough that if I go wrong, please sue me. And that's mandated in the notice. You cannot escape from putting this in your consent notice. Now, there are certain other, uh, you could say, uh, norms and rules that are prescribed for how a valid legal consent should be. So if you don't have a legal valid consent, that also attracts a penalty, which we will see later. But what is it that a legal valid consent should have? The first thing, it should have the details or summary of the data which is being processed. Second, it should have the names and details of the data processors, the names and details of the data fiduciary. So it may happen at one point of time, let's say an organization A is collecting your data, but A has B, C, D organization behind its back also, which is collecting the data, determining how it's going to be processed, etc. So all the details, transparently, who all are the data fiduciaries, all that needs to be uh, explained and disclosed. Then, as I told you, the data processor details have to be mentioned. After that, it's very important that the consent has to be a explicit act of acceptance, which means there cannot be a pre-ticked box. It has to be explicitly where the data principal or uh, you could say takes an affirmative action to agree to that. Now the consent, one of the most important things most lawyers or uh, you know organizations think is that you can really put the consent into a terms of use or into a privacy policy. Now the Indian Act completely says that's not allowed. You need to have it separate. It has to be in simple language. It has to be granular. It has to clearly mention these points. You can't just bundle it with some other document somewhere in the middle you need to have it explicitly, clearly, separately available to a data principal to make an informed decision. Now, consent has another aspect, that is consent of minors. 
Now, today, one of the major uh, users of the internet, users of almost every other service, are minors. Children under 18 are exposed a lot more than what all of us were in our generation. So you need to understand that, you know, they are also major users and consumers of content, digital content, digital services. Now, what happens when a minor is not capable to contract? So under the Indian Contract Act and below the age of 18, a minor is not considered to be of capability to enter into a contract at all. So when you are asking him to consent, he has no right to consent. It's not a valid consent. So in this situation, the law stipulates that a guardian or a parent has to consent and it has to be a verifiable consent. So it cannot be a pre-tick box over here. It has to be verifiable to ensure that it was the parent only who has consented. Now, there is one more special category that has been considered in consent that is disabled people. So people with disability who cannot consent for themselves also an option of verifiable consent has to be provided whereby their guardian has to consent and you have the uh, you have a method to verify that yes this is the person's legal guardian only who has consented so in short in a nutshell that is the concept of consent uh, let's move to the next slide please uh, the next slide please Now we see the rights and duties of a data principle. Now a data principle has the, you could say, privilege, the capability of uh, uh, ensuring that his rights are maintained, are protected. And in the event, any of his rights are breached. He has the right to also approach the data protection board for their enforcement. And in such a situation, when he approaches the data protection board for enforcement is when the inquiry ensues and yes, where you can be prosecuted and the penalty situation arises. So let us just see what exactly is are these rights which are so crucial, which are protected under the act. The right to access information about personal data. So today, let's say um, um, you are a user of a bank services. You have the right to obtain all the information that the bank is collecting about you. And you have the right to know whether or not you have consented for that and specifically what is being done with your data. The next is the right to correction and erasure of personal data. I think this is something which everybody is well aware of the right to be forgotten. So India never had the concept of the right to be forgotten. This act gives the right to be forgotten wherein a, a data subject or a data principle can actually reach out to a data fiduciary and uh, require him to delete all the data that he is storing about them. Now, what happens if a data uh, a principal approaches a data fiduciary and says, I want all my data to be erased? The process is not that easy, which means there has to be legal competence and technical competence to do the same. And the same thing has to percolate down to the data processors. The data processors also have to delete the data. So the data fiduciary has a responsibility to ensure that all the data processors are also within reasonable time frame, deleting that data. And thereafter, a confirmation has to be given to the data principle that all their data has been deleted. The right to correction, wherein a data principle has the right that he can see correction of his data. If anything is wrong, if anything has been changed, addresses have been changed, he has the right to seek correction of the data. The right to grievance redressal. So, the right to grievance redressal primarily is where the data principal can raise issues that he has through his consent manager. Now, consent manager is a very new concept, wherein uh, this is basically uh, stipulated by the act that there would be people who are uh, going to be registered with the board as consent managers. That is the data protection board. And uh, they are the people who would represent the data principals. And uh, uh, in the situation, a data principal has any grievance. Uh, why are the data, uh, data uh, why, why are the consent managers? They can approach the data fiduciary or the DPO of the data fiduciary, the data protection officer of the data fiduciary, seeking redress. It. In the event the data fiduciary fails to redress it, then yes, he can they can even approach the data protection board thereafter and take the necessary actions, uh, which would ensure uh, ensue in the inquiry in the next steps. The right to nominate. Now, this is also very crucial that uh, what happens after your death to your data. So in the event a uh, data principal dies, prior to that, he has a right to, at any point of time in his lifetime, nominate who would be the person who can handle his data post his demise. Now, what are the duties of a data principal? 
The duties are primarily that uh, they will not provide false or wrong data to the data fiduciary. They will not impersonate anybody else and provide wrong data. They are not going to file false and frivolous complaints. And while utilizing the right to correction or erasure, uh, but they are not really going to, uh, you know, provide wrongful information. They will be providing correct information uh, to the data fiduciary. The next slide, please. What are the duties of a data fiduciary? They have to make reasonable efforts to ensure the accuracy accuracy, completeness, and consistency of data. They are also responsible for a reasonable security and safeguards to prevent a data breach. So if they do not have reasonable security safeguards, they can be held up by the board with heavy penalties. So data security is something that they have to mandatorily have. The data fiduciary has to inform the data protection board and the affected persons in the event of a breach. That is called breach notification. Now, this is absolutely mandatory. As a matter of fact, the Act also enunciates in the event of an organization failing to do a breach notification to all the affected persons. Then in that situation, it can attract a penalty up to 200 crores. Now, you need to understand what a breach notification is then. A breach notification cannot be simply a one-liner saying, uh, the data principle, your data has been breached. No. It has to encompass what categories of data were breached what actions the data fiduciary has taken. So what uh, preventive actions he took, what precautions he has exercised thereafter, what damage control he has done. Also, what actions that the data principal can take. So the rights of the data principal have to be disclosed. The board details have to be mentioned in case the data principal wants to complain. He has to be provided those details also. Apart from that, it is very important that in the breach notification, it has to be mentioned that Let's say in the event the breach has been contained, then what level of compromise can happen or what level of risk is there? What level of uh, concern should be there to a data principle that should also be very well described and explained. So in simple words, your breach notification cannot be a one liner saying that, OK, this has happened. That's not a notification. It has to be a well elaborate, uh, a proper elaborate explanatory uh, document that is shared with a data principle. Now, again, if you see, this goes back to an implied situation where you need to mandatorily also have a complete uh, methodology to ensure that your data is being uh, uh, having proper safeguards and you have all of this. So let's say within 72 hours, you are required to do a breach notification. You have to have all the answers to all those questions, which you are actually going to uh, redress and answer in a breach notification. Data fiduciary must erase personal personal data as soon as the purpose has been met and retention is not necessary, data erasure or storage limitation. So in the event you have completed the process for uh, which the data was collected. So let's say you have closed your bank account, then the bank has to delete all your data. They cannot really preserve the data for any other allied services. Now, one thing over here, which I saw with respect to data, a lot of organizations as the act says, digital personal data protection. So felt it only refers to digital data. Now you need to understand one thing. Section three of the act enunciates that the data is referring to digital data. However, it also refers to physical data, which is being converted in digital data and being stored. The only exceptions to this being wherein the, pub, uh, the data of a data principle is already public information. Secondly, where the disclosure of this data is required only by, let's say, any other procedure of law already mandated. Now, if you see over here, there are two parts to the applicability or the collection of data. Digital data, so where a person is collecting the data online. Physical data, which is being stored in a digital format. Now, let me just put to you one situation when uh, there is litigation that can happen. So let's say there is a data principal who files a case against your organization and uh, he provided you data, data physically. So he has walked into your organization, he provided the data to you physically. And thereafter, uh, your data, the data of uh, uh, that particular data principle is leaked online or there is a data breach with respect to that and a digital copy of the data is found. Now, your organization, let's say, has a policy not to maintain any data digitally, but an employee or some other individual who gained access to the physical data in your organization has clicked a picture of that or made a PDF of that and uh, shared it further, leading to the breach. 
So in that situation, the whole onus of proof is going to fall completely upon you as an organization to explain that this data was only kept physically, not digitally. And honestly, believe me, that's a very losing battle. So in a way, you need to understand that this act is only not going to imply a security for a digital data, but it is also going to imply a lot of security to be put in for your physical data. Because uh, this particular act, uh, if you will notice, uh, the concept of data breach over here also refers to accidental data breach, which means uh, a guilty mind of mens rea is not required. So you can't say that, you know, I didn't have the intent for this to happen. That is not something which is going to be considered at all. A guilty mind is not a part of the same. So in this situation, uh, even an act of negligence or anything that goes up and down in your organization unintentionally will also render you liable. So physical data, digital data, both security becomes very important because the burden of proof to prove that this was physically collected and processed completely is on you. There is a supposition which is existing against you that this is digital data. Uh, the next slide, please. So who are the significant data fiduciaries? Significant data fiduciaries are those who would be designated by notification. So since this act is enacted now, there will be a, a circular which will be issued under this, wherein certain organizations will be designated as significant data fiduciaries. The government is sua motor going to do that, designate them central government. Now, on what basis will certain organizations be categorized as significant data fiduciaries? On the volume and sensitivity of the data, on the risk to the rights of data principles. So if it's data which breach can lead to major risks like healthcare organizations or organizations, you know, which uh, wherein it can lead to, uh, you could say tracking of individuals, uh, they're dealing with such data, organizations wherein, you know, compromise of the data can lead to manipulation of those individuals to a certain thought process, where, where the security of the state can be uh, jeopardized or where public order can be jeopardized in the situation of the data being breached. The nature of data being such, then in such a situation, the central government by circular very soon is going to give a list of organizations. Now, one thing you need to understand, there is no option over here. If your organization is in the list of significant data fiduciaries, you have no choice but to have the additional compliance which is mandated for a significant data fiduciary, which is a mandatory data protection officer. You need to in-house appoint a data protection officer, no choice. You need to conduct data protection impact assessments, mandatory. So you have no choice on that either. And you need to engage an independent data auditor to conduct data audits. So what are data audits primarily? Uh, they are audits to check the life cycle of your data, exactly where the security may be uh, elapsed, where it needs to be improvised upon, how the processing is happening, your data mapping processes are good or not. So all of these things need to be considered very well. Uh, the next slide, please. Let's come to the role of a data protection officer and a consent manager. Now, a data protection officer under the Indian law is very different from the one under the EU GDPR. Here, the data protection officer has the responsibility with respect to the data. He is not somebody who can say, I am not responsible. He is responsible for all the practices that are there in an organization. He is the one point contact between the data protection board and the organization to reach out with respect to complaints that may be there, with respect to remediation that is sought by the board, with respect to any and every action that the board wants to enforce within the organization. The data protection officer is also one of the key people who's going to coordinate the data practices. With uh, Puneet, you went mute. Data protection officer is going to be uh, to give a simple example. So, going to uh, coordinate whatever data uh, activities are occurring in the organization, whatever data activities are being outsourced. So, the, uh, the Zoom meeting is getting new, and again, no idea why, but I'm just unmuting it. So, there is a certain pause in the session. So the data protection officer is going to be the individual who is uh, going to coordinate all the activities, outsourced, in-house activities with respect to the data, coordinate what kind of security the data processor is maintaining. So a data fiduciary has a responsibility also towards how the data processor is going to do that. So the data protection officer is the person who's also going to coordinate that. 
he is going to coordinate the legal compliances which may be in house outsourced he is going to uh, coordinate the technical compliances which may be in house outsourced he is going to coordinate all the complaints that are coming in from data principals he is going to coordinate uh, what exactly you know the data processor is doing with the data and not just on paper but it, it's a very proactive activity that is continuously going to happen with respect to the consent manager now through further notification this is going to be elaborated further also but they are primarily individuals or organizations who are going to represent data principals and they would have to be registered with the board to do so and there is going to be a process for that also which will be enunciated very clearly so in a way they are the people who are going to be competent to represent data principals before the board in complaints uh the next slide please cross border data transfer uh, apologies i think there's a, a, a error in that that's data transfer so cross border data transfer is something which uh, has puzzled a lot of people wherein uh, the whole issue was you know uh, can the data be transferred outside the boundaries of india now you need to understand one thing if any organization is processing data so if they are providing a service into india and they are processing indian data by default they have to be compliant with the indian data protection law so currently what is the situation with a large number of organizations they are incorporated in some other country and they say you know we are governed by the law of our nation that option is not existing so if you are dealing with indian data you may be a, a organization registered let's say in, in in europe in united states any other part of the world but you have to comply with the indian law you have no excuse to that again you can be prosecuted under indian law for penalties also you cannot say that uh, there has to be a prosecution only in the uh, country where i am incorporated so right now if you see a lot of organizations that is the stand that they take and this act makes it very clear that that stand is not applicable uh, also you need to understand with respect to cross border data transfer there is a provision with respect to the government is actually going to categorize there is going to be a circular also where certain categories of data will not be allowed to be processed outside india so that is also going to come forth next so if your organization is going to deal with that data you are not going to be allowed to process that sensitive data outside the country now those categories of data will be provided separately by rules that will be enacted under this particular act very soon uh, the next slide please what are the authorities under the act there is a data protection board consisting of chairman members whose job is to ensure that this act is being implemented uh, they are the bodies also which are going to conduct inquiries when complaints are filed by data principals with them the procedure that is going to be followed by them is that of the civil procedure code wherein they will conduct inquiries they can summon the organization they can penalize the organization now where does the appeal lie from a data protection board order there is going to be an appellate authority to whom the appeal will also lie within 60 days an appeal can be filed by an organization or individual who is being prosecuted now one important thing that comes up is can individual professionals be prosecuted they can so in the event that you are providing services to any organization any other individual you are dealing with sensitive personal data and information and you fail to secure that data and a data breach happens then yes you can also be prosecuted in that capacity so these are the authorities under the act now you need to understand one thing that this is a civil authority for compensation or penalties which we are going to see further but the act has clearly mentioned that you know if there is any other case that comes up so let's say there is a data breach the only way a data principal can claim compensation and can take action against an organization or individual who has breached their data for civil remedy is under the data protection act which means he has to approach the data protection board so civil courts are barred but there is no bar that is there on the criminal courts which means in the situation of a data breach very well a data principal along with claiming compensation can also seek criminal prosecution so the jurisdiction bar is only on civil courts and not on criminal courts so you need to understand even right now when there are cases which are there with respect to uh, data breaches where there was section 43a of the act uh, in, uh, the uh, information technology act um, in cases of data breaches always there was an fir which was also filed uh, as a practice and along with that a, com a complaint for compensation before the adjudicating officer claiming you know up to 5 crores of penalty or 5 5 crores of compensation 
So even right now, the regime was where both civil and criminal remedies can be pursued at the same time. So as an organization, even right now, the system remains the same. So the Data Protection Act has not changed that. You can be prosecuted criminally and in a civil fashion for the penalty in the same fashion. You will continue to be prosecuted both ways. So you can't say that there is a penalty case. So thereafter, you know, there can be no FIR filed against you. That is not the case. The criminal route is separate and will continue. The next slide, please. So what are the penalties under the Act? The penalties, uh, to just give a brief idea to you, in our country, we have never had penalties to this nature. If you would ever read the Indian Penal Code, there are pen, you know comp, there is penalty to the tune you know, of 50 rupees in certain offences, 500 rupees, 5,000 rupees, 10,000 rupees is like a very high penalty under the Indian Penal Code. Now, the Data Protection Act suddenly has a very high level of penalty which is unheard of or unseen of in any Indian legislation. Not just Indian legislation, but globally legislations do not have this high level of penalties. So where there is a breach of the obligations of the data fiduciary, which we already saw what are the obligations, and they have not reasonably taken security safeguards, they can be prosecuted to the tune of 250 crores. Now, reasonable security safeguards to prevent a data breach, all of this is very, very subjective, which means very strong compliance, documentation, legal, technical, everything has to be there in an organization to prove that they have followed a certain uh, compliance to the act to ensure that, you know, the penalty is not as high as this. The next breach in observing the obligation to give the board or affected data principal a notice of personal data breach. So where the breach notification has not been made in that situation, as I told you already, 200 crore rupees after that, a penalty can be imposed. A uh, breach in observance of uh, the rights of a data principal or obligations with respect to children, the penalty will extend up to 200 crores. Breach in observance of additional obligations of a data fiduciary. So where, let's say, the data audits have not been conducted uh, annually, where the data protection impact assessments are not there, where a proper DPO has not been appointed, and not a namesake DPO. A DPO actually performing the role, duties, everything documented in the right way to be able to be presented. So what we are looking here is a legal representation. You cannot just have data or whatever you are doing in your organization if it is of no use to be presented in a court of law. Because end of the day, when you're going to be prosecuted, it is something that has to be presented before a judge. It has to be presented before the board over here. And they have to be convinced that, you know, this was adequate enough and the penalty should not be that much. So you need to understand that all of these things that we are talking about, the compliances, they have to be in such a fashion that they can actually be presented in a court of law. They cannot be completely, uh, you could say, you know, I'm in an organization, I'm doing what I want, and this is good enough. That's not how it would work. It has to be in tandem with, uh, at the end of the day, you have to be represented. So it has to be in tandem that, you know, the representation has to be proper in that situation. The nature of penalties being so high, yes, so keeping that in mind, uh, you need to be very cautious about uh, how you are complying with the Act. Uh, then thereafter, breach in notification of the duties. So whatever duties were there of the data fiduciary, if he fails to um, adhere to that, uh, uh, there, was, there is a penalty of 10,000 rupees. This is the lowest penalty in this Act, actually. Breach of any other provision that was there, any other provision in the Act, there are multiple provisions in the Act, a penalty up to 50 crore rupees would be imposed out there. The next slide, please. Uh, with this, I come to the end of this session. And uh, all of you further you require any data, you can get in touch with me. You can follow me on my YouTube channel, LinkedIn, Twitter, multiple other places where you can follow content I'm sharing about the act. But uh, uh, please feel free to ask any other questions at this point. Uh, so here, uh, uh, Puneet, uh, we had uh, uh, during registration, opened up questions uh, with our members and we were surprised to get uh, around 70 questions. In the span of uh, the next 10-15 minutes, it's not possible to do that. But quickly, I will touch upon uh, 5 to 10 questions which we feel are important. Yeah. So quickly getting on to the questions, we have uh, uh, a first question from Ravi Kumar, Hyderabad. How this entire act helps for data center businesses? Uh, well, you need to understand the government is going to issue a circular, that is for sure, which is going to specify certain classes of data. I cannot divulge what, but certain classes of data, the processing is not going to be allowed outside the country. 
So pretty much you can understand that's going to be the sensitive personal data categories. And uh, again, as the concept existing that uh, these categories of data for sovereignties, uh, security of our nation are very important. They don't get shared uh, outside for processing. So, uh, you know, once this list and circular comes out of what categories of data cannot be processed outside the country, in that situation, yes, Indian uh, data centers are going to have booming business. So you can be rest assured right now itself that what you're looking at is a, a considerable category of personal data, which will have to be processed by any organization uh, outside India wanting to give services to India will have to kind of, for those categories of data, only keep the data in India for processing. So the circular and rules, the act itself mentions that there will be a circular with respect to this effect that will be uh, further issued. Thanks. The next question is uh, from Prashant Pandit uh, from Pune. And he says, in the real estate uh, industry, what precautions we should take when we sign agreement with vendors like visitor management systems? Well, I think there you need to be highly cautious because uh, those organizations uh, are the ones who tend to collect a lot of data. They may not have adequate security. And end of the day, since you are the person determining the collection of data, you are the data fiduciary. The penalty is going to be imposed upon you and not upon that vendor. He's simply a data processor. You can continue after that suing him for years to try to recover the money. The responsibility lies upon you. So end of the day, you need to have very strong contractual obligations. As I, and as I mentioned, when you're talking of data audits, it's not just data audits of your organization. It's data audits of your data processors also. Because end of the day, as a data fiduciary, who's going to be prosecuted? It's you who's going to be prosecuted. You are going to pay those penalties. So it's your job to invest in the data security and ensure that you know your uh, vendors are doing the same job. Ensure that there's a data audit of theirs. You need to ensure that things are in line for you, end of the day. Okay, the next question is from Subramani P from Coimbatore. He says details on DDPP versus employee data. Well, employee data is something which is very tricky because organizations today are collecting employee data left, right, center, everything possible, including health information. And uh, there isn't so much focus of security that is provided on that data. People feel that, you know, customer data has to be secured, that there's monetization there, not employee data. But you need to understand the act is not bifurcating in the data. So whether the data belongs to your customer, it belongs to your vendor, it belongs to your uh, employee. If it's personal data, the same act and the same rules are going to apply. Next, we have uh, Vijay Sivaraman from Chennai. He says that if we collect customer information through the e-commerce portal or uh, WhatsApp shop, can we push promotions through WhatsApp? Well, see, if you're collecting data without a valid consent, notice of consent, you need to be able to prove all of that. And that is when the question of you using that data comes. So a lot of data, uh, you could say analytics, business intelligence practices, marketing, digital marketing practices in India are going to change. And the act is not going to come in force. It is already enacted. The president assent of it was already received on 11th of August, which means it's already enforced. You can at any point of time be prosecuted. So you may think the board is not formed. You may think that the data protection board, the civil body for penalties is not formed, but the criminal liability still exists. Nobody is stopping anybody from prosecuting you in uh, um, uh, the criminal courts, really. So the act is enacted. It's not something that's going to happen later. Uh, then we have a question from uh, Mr. Tapan Pota from Ahmedabad. He says, what happens to the data which is already collected prior to this bills uh, or the act introduction? Now, for all the data that is already connect, uh, collected, the act actually enunciates that uh, you need to take an explicit consent from all those people whose data you have collected. And uh, once they give explicit consent, you can continue to process in the event they do not, then you would have to erase the data. Next is uh, Ranjit Paul from Kerala. He says, what are the proposed clauses in the Digital Data Protection Bill regarding handling of personal data of users below 18 years? So you said uh, oh. earlier that uh, consent is not valid. Yes, verifiable consent is very important. And uh, in cases you are targeting audiences which are uh, children, you need to have additional security, data security. You need, you cannot track them. You cannot have, uh, you could say, behavioral analysis uh, done to their data. These are additional conditions that are there. You need to have verifiable consent from a guardian or a parent, which is provable that the parent or the guardian has actually consented. Uh, the second last question is from Anand Ruhela from Gangtok Sikkim. Uh, he's asking this relevance of DPDP to higher education or protection of student uh, data 
we believe yeah, obviously in any any educational institution also has to ensure that the student data is uh, safeguarded so we are talking of any and every personal data so yes even educational institutes can be prosecuted under this law understand mm -hmm. and uh, one we have uh, jitu gupta from new law college uh, mumbai we also have some law uh, students have joined and uh, they are asking is how do you see now a career in pursuing digital privacy law well again i'll come back to the point uh, i know there are a lot of universities that offer uh, specializations in cyber law masters uh, you need to understand it's a branch of criminal law so you first of all need to have a good grasp of criminal law practice of criminal law there is a good career if you're a good criminal lawyer it's like you're a good surgeon you can do a good operation on the nose brain or the uh, heart based on where your interest lies and where you are trained for so if you wish to pursue a career in this please start your journey with uh, a good knowledge of criminal law good number of years of practice of criminal law and then specialize into the branch having the knowledge of that a uh, simple thing for students over here who are there uh, uh, a simple example if you are a doctor you may have an mbbs degree you have a ms degree in theory so an ms degree in theory is not going to enable you to operate on a patient without the practical aspects of it so start with the basics of criminal law learn practicing trials learn how the whole process happens and then you can specialize and appear for let's say crimes to body crimes to property or your crimes to data excellent so uh, dear folks uh, uh, dear members i'm sure even 3 hours wouldn't be enough on this topic and we need to close for the evening unfortunately we are right on the clock uh, it is my honor to extend a heartfelt word of thanks to advocate pulit bashin for gracing us with the profound wisdom and sharing an invaluable expertise advocate bashin your deep insights into today's uh, digital protection data protection bill and the associate cyber laws have left us a mark on our understanding we extend our sincere gratitude for taking the time to share our knowledge your knowledge experience and perspectives with us your guidance will undoubtedly serve us as a beacon for all of us for now navigating the ever evolving landscape of digital legalities so on behalf of the cia club mumbai chapter and all the uh, club members across all chapters uh, i extend a heartfelt appreciation to you your presence has added a layer of depth to our event and your insights will continue to resonate with us as we move forward thank you once again for being a beacon of knowledge and an inspiration to us all thank you uh, thank you thank you nihar for inviting me to this session and one thing actually i think somebody in the comments pointed out uh, my website is www.punithbhasin.in not com so somebody just commented they were not able to access the site so it's punithbhasin.in not com we uh, we will i will uh, circulate uh, the video the slides we we'll edit the sure. slides and do that yeah? yes yes and maybe uh, looking forward uh, we will have another session going forward maybe six months down the line or a year down the line to see how the actual act uh, places what are the cases use cases what happened and when uh, the, uh, the whole thing comes down boils down uh, to a more understandable uh, means yeah yes i'm quite sure the audience here would not want to be the use case because initially yes there are going to be multiple categories of organizations which will be prosecuted so yes nobody wants to be that use case for sure yeah thanks a lot thanks a lot so we are right on time 7:59 uh, uh, i'm sure uh, members are uh, very happy about it we will have a feedback form sent and we'll surely say, uh, share the feedback with you thank yeah? you very thank, thank you. you good night good night good night thanks 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 everyone